you'd open your Bibles with me to John the 8th chapter of the Gospel as recorded by. People need to be careful, Brother Jack. A lot of people have a habit of saying the Gospel of John. Or the Gospel of Mark. It's not the Gospel of either of those. It is the Gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded by. That's right. Amen. That is right. John, the 8th chapter, we're going to read this evening the first 12 verses. And I'm doing 12 verses for a reason tonight. Because I want to make a point in keeping things in context, I want to make a point. Amen. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 12. Those of us who are able stand in honor of the reading of God's word. The King James text tonight reads, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the crown, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman! Where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Amen. You, most preachers, when they read this story, Brother Jack, they don't include verse 12, do they? No. Why should we see what the Lord says immediately after dismissing this lady? Amen. I'll tell you why in a moment. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you, God, and we thank you. Lord, for the presence of the Holy Ghost that we feel in the house of God tonight. Surely, Lord Jesus, is the sweetest name I know. It was sweet to me in my childhood. It was sweet to me in my young adulthood. It was sweet to me in my teens. It remains sweet to me even now. Master, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that your holy anointing, the power of God, the presence of the Holy Ghost, would be very real at this hour. Anoint your servant, God, that I might do the word of God justice. You've given me a word. You've placed it in my spirit and spoken to me to deliver it to your people. But God, tonight, I am the least among my brethren. And God, there is nothing I can do for your people without your help and your anointing. Prepare every ear, but moreover every heart to receive what you will speak to us at this hour. For we ask it in that holy name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated tonight. I've told you in recent days that I have been doing some research concerning 
the Jewish attitude sort toward certain uh, things and certain issues and Jewish teaching toward certain things. Well, in the process of doing this uh, research, you know, I wind up being exposed to all kinds of peripheral information that helps me to better understand other things as well besides just the issue that I'm looking at directly. And one of the things that I've really been amazed in reading the writings of various rabbis, the Jewish faith is focused only on the action. Mm -hmm. They don't focus on the person. Say, Pastor, I don't quite understand what you mean. Well, have you not ever wondered how in the world it is that the law of Moses could call for an adulteress or an adulterer like the one we're reading in our story tonight, in our primary text tonight? The law calls for someone who is an, commits adultery, not someone who is an adulteress. Mm -hmm. Right. Are you hearing me? No. Mm -hmm. It calls for someone who commits adultery. Honey, you can commit it once, and if you get caught in the act, that's good enough. You don't have to have an ongoing track record. All you have to do to be condemned by the law of Moses, according to the rabbis, is be caught in the act. It doesn't matter what people believe about you it doesn't matter the rumors it does not matter the speculation haven't you ever wondered how it is that certain people in the word of god could have such foul reputations and yet they're still moving around and living and uh-huh Hadn't you ever wondered about that? The woman who came to the Lord and washed his feet with her tears and dried it with her hair and anointed him with ointment. Haven't you ever wondered how that lady could have the reputation she had and yet still she was able to do this thing? How could she have this reputation and not have been stoned for it? Yeah. How is it that Mary Magdalene was called a woman of ill repute. And tradition tells us she had been a prostitute and she had had demons and all these terrible things in her life. How in the world, brother? Mm -hmm. yeah. How do these people have such reputations and yet they still are living when the law clearly condemns their actions? Uh -huh. Yeah. The reason is simple. And in order to understand it, you have got to understand Jewish thinking. You have got to understand how the Jewish people approached the Word of God. How they approached the Law of Moses. They approach it based upon the act. Mm -hmm. And they believe that God says exactly what He means. He does not say uh, if he says something partially, then he meant it partially. Mm -hmm. For instance, as an example, when they, when the strictest of conservative Jewish rabbis read Leviticus, a man shall not lie with a man as with a woman, and they oh, interpret wow. that as relating to homosexual yes. action and yes. homosexual behavior. Yes. The majority of the strictest, most conservative Jewish rabbis in our world today and going back for centuries have interpreted that to speak only, only yeah. to male-on-male -male intercourse. Yeah, that's true. They did not look down upon two men that had a loving relationship Oh, my Lord, mm -hmm. I'm telling you the truth today, folks. Mm -hmm. And if those men engaged in all kinds of other phallic activity, they did not condemn that activity because that's not what God said. Mm -hmm. 
Are you hearing what I'm saying? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Okay? So, the way that many in the Christian community approach things is so contrary to the way oh, that the yes. Jews of Jesus' day approach oh, things. Lord. We have people in our society today that want to kill homosexual people simply because they identify as homosexual people. It wouldn't even matter to them if you never engaged in any kind of sexual activity whatsoever. How do they know that you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've told you before and I'll tell you again, I know gay couples... And by the way, I, I've said this before and again, I'll say it. They acknowledge that nowhere in the law of Moses is there a prohibition for women having sexual contact with other women. Right. All the impetus is on men. On man. Okay, now listen up carefully. When they brought this woman before Jesus, and they threw her down on the ground and with such bitterness and disdain announced to him that this was an adulteress. How do we know? We caught her in the very act. We caught her in. And when they quoted the law of Moses, from their perspective, they were saying more than she has broken this law. But they were also saying, we have met the test. We have done what we're supposed to do. She was caught in the very act. It's one thing to commit a, a violation of the law. It is another thing to do it carelessly. Mm -hmm. Oh, my Lord, I hope you're hearing me. See, she got caught in the act because some way, somehow, Somebody saw her doing something somewhere with yeah. somebody she shouldn't have been doing something somewhere with. Yeah. Oh, my Lord, right. have mercy. <laughs> we got people in the world today that are having their little extramarital affairs, brother Richard, and they'll run out in their car and they'll have a little parking session out at the city park. Am I talking too vulgar for some? No, I hope not, but I'm going to tell it the way it is. And they're careless because all of a sudden a police officer comes along and he shines that light into the car and he sees them in the back seat copulating. Am I telling the truth now? Yes, you are. See, it's one thing to break the law of Moses. It's another thing to do it carelessly. If you're going to do it, at least cover your tracks well. Make sure you don't have any witnesses. Hello now. Now at that time, in, in, in that society, you couldn't very well go to a hotel and rent a room. No. Because chances are the guy behind the desk was also a Jew. Hello now. Mm -hmm. And if you went to him and you wanted a room where you as a married man could have an, a fling with this young woman, he wasn't going to be looking very kindly upon that. But you know what? We've got people in our society today who operate hotels and motels specifically to accommodate these very yes, things. That's, yep. true. Mm -hmm. that's true. We've got people in our society today who specifically operate motels knowing, brother, that they're down there on Harry Hines where all the hookers hang. And they know good and well that they're accommodating a bunch of hookers and a bunch of johns. And they know good and well that they are accommodating adultery. They don't care so long as they make their money. Hello now. Listen, do you think there were not people like that in biblical times? Please. Do you think there were not people in biblical times who would be willing to accommodate you and they, as long as they got their money, they didn't care what you were doing behind closed doors? Do you honestly think that that did not exist? Honey, if there were adulterers in biblical times, you better believe there were businessmen who were willing to accommodate adulterers. That's right. Yeah, they had to have a plug. So there... Surely was some way for this woman 
and the man with whom she was involved. Surely there was some way for them to secretly, privately find their way somewhere. You would think so. But you know, I, I've seen enough movies in my day to know that people, when they get horn doggy enough, yes. they'll do some stupid things in some stupid places. Mm -hmm. yep. Some people, brother, just duck off into a alley somewhere. Mm -hmm. Now they may not be able to do the full Monty. They may not be able to do the full act. Hello now. Mm -hmm. But there are things they can do. Is that what happened in this story? We don't know. Possibly. Probably. Maybe. Because somehow, some way, she was caught doing something with a married man that she ought not to have been doing. And apparently when they were caught, they must have been somewhere, Brother Jack, where he could easily escape. Mm -hmm. He could easily run and escape their hands. Good thing for him because the Jewish law focuses on the action. Mm -hmm. If they do not act upon this now, listen to me, they will have lost their opportunity. My Lord have mercy. They bring this lady, they throw her at the feet of Jesus, and they say, she's guilty of adultery. How do we know? We know because we caught her in the very act. There's no escaping. This woman has no way out. This woman has been painted by the law of Moses into a corner, and honey, there are no loopholes remaining. She was caught in the very act. That is what is necessary to even bring charges against her. If all it were were rumors, if all it were were hearsay, if all it were were reputation, they could not bring her before the Lord, but they caught her in the very act. And the test of the law of Moses was satisfied. And now she stood condemned by God and condemned by men without a hope in the world. Uh -huh. My God. They put her before Jesus and say, but what do you say? Yep. The Word of God said they were trying to trick him. They were trying to trip him up. They knew good and well, Brother Richard, yes. that what he was going to say was not going to be what they wanted to hear. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh-huh. They might not have known what words he would use. They might not, oh hallelujah, they might not have known exactly what direction he was going to go in, but they knew based on past experience, they knew based on their uh, walking with this man and seeing the way he spoke and acted, they knew that he was bound to say something that in their minds would totally contradict the law of Moses and allow them then to hold him in contempt and brand him a heretic. Mm -hmm. I've told you before, some people in the Christian community think that the best answer is always the spoken answer. Uh -huh. And that is not true. Sometimes wisdom dictates that you shut your mouth, remain quiet, remain still. Hello now. Sometimes the best answer is no answer. Exactly. See, there are some people, they get into a debate with somebody or they get into a conversation with somebody, Brother Jack, and they just think, bless God, I've got to be able to come back and answer every word this Bible. Oh, oh, Lord, I need you to give me the right answer to give to everything this person says. Well, the right answer might be get up and walk away. That might be the right answer. But instead, you stand there and you keep debating and you keep arguing. Well, the Lord's initial answer was silence. 
They put it to him. They hit that tennis ball into his side of the court and they were waiting for him to hit it back. And he just let it go right over his shoulder. Yes, he did. One point for you. Kneels down in the sand, begins to draw. Yeah. Starts doing something. But the Word of God doesn't tell us. I've heard all kinds of speculation. I don't like speculation. Amen. Amen. I don't like people that try to make something out of something when we're not told what all he drew and what all he said. I believe in all, with all my heart that all the Lord drew in that sand was a line. Mm -hmm. That's what I think he drew. I think he drew a line in the sand. You see, that old sand, he drew a line in the sand, or you, you know, there's a line in the sand. We're all familiar with that saying. Well, what that saying simply means is you're delineating a position and saying, I dare you to come across that position. Mm -hmm. This is, a, I dare you to step across this line. Yeah. I believe all he drew on that ground, brother, was the line. line. Then he stood up and said, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to articulate a position and let's see which one of you is brave enough to cross the line. Let he that is among you who is without sin, let him cast the first stone at her. That's true. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a line in the sand. Do I have the guts to cross that line or not? I'm talking to you tonight about caught in the act, okay? Mm -hmm. He then goes down, and the word of God says he starts drawing again. I believe he drew another line. Yeah. I believe those two lines intersected. Oh, hallelujah. Now, I could be wrong. I believe they intersected not directly in the middle as if to make an X, but I believe slightly to one side or the other. He drew a second line, and it wasn't quite as long as the first line. And there on the ground, as they looked down, not knowing what in the world he's drawn or why, was the symbol of the cross. And Jesus was without words saying, here's the line in the sand. Which one of you dares to go beyond the cross? Oh my, oh my God, have mercy. Oh my goodness. There's the line. Let me tell you something, brother. Those Jewish men thought themselves so smart because they had the perfect yeah. test to place in front of Jesus. We finally got somebody stupid enough to act in a way that was careless and foolish and we finally have somebody that we can put in front of him that the law is fully satisfied to condemn. He won't have any out. He won't have any way around this one. Let him that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. That's right. That's right. He began to think about his words and oh shoot, he did it again. <laughs> Doggone it, he did it again. He got him again. I don't even I don't even believe I could go get my rabbi right now from the synagogue I attend. I don't even think I could get him and he could throw a stone because even my rabbi is as human as I am. <laughs> I don't believe I could even go get the chief priest and get him back here in time so he can throw a stone at him because I've seen the chief priest. I've seen him cross over the boundaries of the law. Oh my God, have mercy. Yes. One by one, they begin to dissipate from the oldest to the youngest. I'm going to tell you, I honestly believe that's the case because older people have more wisdom. 
And older, the older you get, the more honest you tend to be with yourself and the world. My great-grandmother lived to be 89 years old. And I'm going to tell you, when I come out, my great-grandmother had the least problem with it of anybody in the family. Uh-huh. Haven't you noticed a lot of times that's the case? We always talk about how the older folks are stuck in the mud and bless God. They have all these old ideas. And I'm going to tell you something. The older you get, a lot of times those are the least that are stuck in the mud. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They're the ones who look at the world the most realistically. They're the ones who look at the world and understand it from a perspective that you're not even going to get till you live another 30 or 40 or 50 uh -huh. years. That's right. That's right. That's right. And those older men, Brother Jackson, oh, no, call it. But you know, the younger, oh, they love to sit in judgment. They love to be critical. They love to be the one to condemn. And they held out as long as they could. Yeah. But their conscience still bit them on the backside and made them run from the room. Yes. Oh, yes. Amen. Oh, I want to tell you. Then my Jesus stands up. Oh. And he looks at that little lady and he talks to her. Oh. And he says, hey, where are thine accusers? Oh, mm -hmm. she says, I don't have any, Lord. <laughs> There's not a one. There's nobody standing in judgment of me. There's nobody condemning me. Everybody that stood before Jesus that day, listen to me carefully. Every man that stood before the Lord that day was anything but a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. A hypocrite would have started throwing stones. That's right. I'm going to tell you something, Brother Richard. The church today is full of hypocrites. Oh, yes. The church today is full of a bunch of people who think that they can bring others before the Lord and throw them at His feet and they fully expect a word of condemnation. They fully expect Amen. the Lord to Amen. condemn them and criticize Amen. them. They fully expect the judgment of God to be called down from heaven. That's right. Yep. And instead of saying what they want them to say, the Lord draws a cross in the sand and says, Hey, are you able to go to this cross? Because the only one who's in a position to condemn this woman is the only one here who's worthy to go to this cross. Mm -hmm. Yes. My yes. Lord, have mercy. Yes. yes. I want to tell you today, I'm talking about being caught in the act. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to tell you, that little lady was caught in the act. She did something foolish and she did it carelessly so that she was easily able to be apprehended during yeah. her act. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you today, the Holy Ghost has spoken to my heart and he said, I have caught so many in the church world in the act. And I say, Lord, what? In the act of breaking your law, in the act of doing something contrary to your law? And he says, yeah, exactly. For I've mandated that you're not to judge, but they're judging. Mm -hmm. I've mandated that they ought to love their neighbor. They're not loving their neighbor. Right. I've mandated that you're to treat your neighbor as you would treat yourself. And they are not treating their neighbor as they treat themselves. Because they would not want their neighbor taking them at the first opportunity of their sin or their failure or their weakness being exposed. Uh -huh. And casting them at my feet. And calling down the judgment of God upon them. They wouldn't want that, but they're happy to deal that out. Uh-uh. Yeah. Said too many in the church today have been caught in the act. Listen to me, saints, tonight. Of thinking they are more righteous and more holy than I am. Uh-huh. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
you think committing adultery is a bigger offense to God than thinking you're holier than He is, think again. Oh, that's right. Think again. You think somebody being homosexual is a bigger offense to God than somebody thinking that their righteousness exceeds that of the Lord Himself? Think again. Think again. Think again. The last guy who made the statement, I will be as God, was cast out of heaven for that vanity and that pride. Uh -huh. Jesus said to his disciples, they called them the sons of thunder, as they spoke to him, shall we call down fire from the sky to consume this city that would not accommodate us and would not be hospitable to us? And Jesus turned around and said, what manner of spirit are ye? God have mercy. Oh, yes. Woo. Many in the church today, Brother Jack, are operating under the influence of a spirit, but it is not the spirit of God. Oh, it is Lord. not the Holy Ghost from heaven. No. It's the truth, it's the truth. And yet they have convinced themselves it is. It is. Uh huh. Yes. Yes, it is. Word of God Ooh. said in the last days he would turn them over to a reprobate mind. So that they should believe a lie. 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 And they think they can interpret that passage. And they think they can apply it to everybody else. When in reality it is speaking of them. Uh -huh. And the fact that they are clearly visibly, undeniably under the influence and power of the God of this world mm -hmm. and the prince and the power of the air, uh -huh. the prince of darkness, the author of hatred, the author of wickedness, the author, the author of malice, the author of envy. That is whom they are under. That is whose power they work through. Yes. You forget Satan's declaration before his fall included that he would sit at the head of the sanctuary of the Almighty. Mm -hmm. Got news for you. He's doing it. Mm -hmm. He's doing it. He's accomplished it. He's got all kinds of people thinking they are in the church of Jesus Christ when in reality, read the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. What does the Lord say? The Lord says they're in the sanctuary of Satan. Satan. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, have mercy. Oh, yeah. Folks, I want to tell you something today. There is a reason why we have been told by the word of God, judge not least you be judged. There is a reason in the word of God why we are told to love your neighbor as yourself. There is a reason in the word of God why we are told by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. We are not called to sit and police one another. We are not called to sit and judge and condemn one another. I've been in too many churches in my life where too many people did exactly that very thing and they would condemn and they would criticize and they would judge and not because they had ever seen anyone in the act of anything but they would do it based solely upon reputation they would do it based solely upon accusation they would do it based solely upon someone's gossip yes yes Hallelujah. Oh, yes. When the Lord drew that line in the sand, my friend, I'm going to tell you something. He was saying, who's going to be on my side? Because anybody on my side is going to act like me. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more.
Anybody that's on my side is going to resemble me. They are going to act like me. They are going to epitomize me. Am I telling the truth? Yes. Oh my God, let me tell you how I know I'm telling the truth. Because when this story was all done, pretty simple message tonight. When this story was all done, and that little lady got up and began to walk to her house, having been exonerated, as it were, by the Lord. Praise the Lord. Then spake Jesus again mm -hmm. unto them, said, this story ain't over. Preacher, how dare you quit where the Word of God says that he looks at her and says, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. And you act like everything's finished. It's not finished. Then spake Jesus again unto them. Who? The same man he was talking to before. Yes. What she... Walked away, they pulled back in. <laughs> then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. Listen to me. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Meaning what? I illuminate. I show you the way. I show you what's right. I show you what's wrong. He that followeth me, the one that does like me, the one who, oh hallelujah, the one who walks like me, the one who talks like me, the one who acts like me, do you hear what I'm telling you? Shall not walk in darkness. Oh, glory to God. I'm here to tell you, <laughs> glory to God. Caught in the act. I don't ever, I don't ever want to stand before God in the judgment and have the Lord say to me, Son, you were caught in the act. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You thought yourself holier than me. Okay. Lord, I never thought I was holier than you. Then how could you sit in judgment of anyone? That's right. Oh, yes. Lord, I never thought I was more righteous than you. Then how could you condemn anyone? Uh -huh. right. Lord, I never for one minute believed I was more than you are. Oh, really? Then how come you called for the death? Of this group of people. Uh -huh. And you pointed to the law. As your justification. Did you not see the example I set for you. When they brought before me a woman caught. In the very act of adultery. Did you not see the example. Mm -hmm. I didn't do these things just to do them. I did them so that those who had the in their life could also do them. Yes. Praise the Lord. We talk about miracles. We talk about the manifestation of the power of God. And Jesus said, greater works than these shall they do which come after me. And we think he's talking about miracles. We think he's talking about all these spectacular, supernatural things, and in part he is. But he's also saying, if you think you've seen love manifested in me, greater works than these shall they do which come after me. If you think you've seen grace manifested in me, Greater works shall they do that come after me. Do you think you've seen me acting in compassion? Greater works than these shall they do that come after me. Have you seen me manifest and demonstrate the love of God? Greater works than these shall they do which come after me. Oh, church, I want to tell you today. I remember years ago. Many years ago, and I'm trying to close tonight. I remember many years ago, I had a vision of sorts. 
can't remember if I was praying. I was, it was many, many, many years ago. I was probably all of 20. I might have been pastor in my first church at the time. I had a vision of the rapture. I saw the earth from a distance. Oh, okay. I heard the trump of God sound. I saw Jesus. Woo, hallelujah. I saw Jesus in the air. Oh. I saw the saints of God rising from around the globe to meet him. I literally saw people from around the planet coming and being drawn. I, I can't even describe it, but being drawn almost magnetically to where the Lord was. And there weren't very many people. You see these illustrations that these religious right folks love to put together. And you see the illustrations they have of the rapture. My God, to hear them tell it, brother, 80% of the human population is going to go up. Mm -hmm. Well, they got pictures of people in cars going up. They got pictures of people in airplanes going up. They got pictures of people in buses going up. They got people of pictures of dozens of people from a single uh, high-rise building. That's not what I saw in my vision. In my vision, literally, it, what I saw in my vision was dozens of people. Now, don't misunderstand me. This was not a literal vision. Right. Right. Okay, I'm not saying the Lord said dozens of people were going to make it to heaven. That's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But I literally said when I saw this, Dear Jesus, that few... See, immediately my mind just said, that few? How, how could it be that few? And the voice of the Lord spoke back to me and said, fewer than you think. Fewer than you think. Yep. See, back in those days, Brother Jack, I thought if you had high hair and long sleeves, uh -huh. that heaven was guaranteed. Uh -huh. Back in those days, I thought that if you lived a certain code and a certain ethic and you embraced a certain lifestyle, that, bless God, heaven was guaranteed. And God told me it was still fewer than I thought. Uh -huh. Are you hearing what I'm uh -huh. telling you today? Because uh -huh. I'm going to tell you something. Jesus is not coming for people that call his name. Jesus is coming for people that act like him. Uh-huh. That's right. The Word of God said we're to walk in the light as He is in the light. We're to follow His example. Honey, I'm going to tell you, if you call yourself a Christian today and you're not acting like Jesus, you are not a Christian! Preach it, brother. Preach it, brother. You are not a Christian! Preach it, brother. Yes. Woo! Hallelujah. Glory. Caught Jesus. in the act. The only way they could legally drag that woman and throw her at Jesus' feet is if they caught her in the very act. Because the law is about action. It's not about reputation. It's not about innuendo. It's not about uh, rumor and gossip. I've had people cut me off from all communication will have nothing to do with me because they heard something about me uh -huh. mm -hmm. that they don't like. They never asked me about it. So how they know it's true, I don't quite know. Ain't nobody I know talk to them who knows for a fact that any of those rumors are true because there wasn't none of them in my bedroom at any given time, at any moment in time. Huh? Unless they stood outside my home with binoculars. Yes. And I've got enough sense to close my blinds. Mm -hmm. But this is Christ-like behavior. Jesus wouldn't even condemn the woman who was caught and in the yeah. act. And there are people in the church, brother, who will condemn you to hell. Mm -hmm. Who will cut you off and have nothing to do with you because they heard. Mm -hmm. 
I heard he's a homosexual. Well, honey, until I invite you into my bedroom and ask you to watch me and my partner have intercourse, you are on very shaky ground. That's right. Very. If I don't ask you to participate. Uh-huh. Yes. Oh, my God, have uh -huh. mercy. Uh -huh. Now do you understand the story of Sodom? Uh-huh. They tried to get the visitors to participate involuntarily. Doesn't matter what they wanted to do with them. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Uh -huh. They were trying to drag these men into participation. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, have mercy. Yes, mm -hmm. Christian, if that queer next door to you isn't asking you to go to bed with him, then no. you have no business sitting in judgment of that individual. Exactly. You have no business criticizing right. that individual. You have no business judging that individual. You have no business mistreating that individual. You have no business in the universe exactly. of thinking or acting in any way evil toward that individual. That's right. That's right. That's the word of God. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. That's right. And if you think yourself better than the God who went to the cross for your redemption, then you keep sitting in judgment. You keep criticizing. You keep throwing stones. And when the rapture comes, you'll still be lining your pockets with pebbles. Uh -huh. Because you ain't going nowhere. That's right. Okay. He's coming for a church that has made itself ready. A church that oh, is without yes. spot or yes. blemish. Yes. Oh, I want to tell you today. He's coming for a church, folks, that doesn't act like the world. He's coming for a church that don't treat people like the world treats people. He's coming for a church that doesn't live by a worldly, carnal, man-made code of ethics or behavior. He is coming for a church that has chosen to emulate Him. He is coming for a church that is has made its mind up that they are going to resemble him, that they are going to look like him, they're going to act like him, they're going to walk like him, they're going to talk like him. That's the church he's coming for. And it'll be fewer going than you think. Would you stand with me this evening? Amen. Praise God and amen.